I'm at the University of Virginia in the United States. Uh, it's in the Department of Psychiatry, but we have a special research division called the Division of Perceptual Studies, where we look at phenomena that relate to the mind-brain question and also the question of survival after death. Uh, so I'm a child psychiatrist, and my particular interest is in uh, children who say that they remember past lives. Um, and, and this is work that has gone on at the university for 50 years. It involves these children from all over the world, basically, who at a very early age start saying that they remember past lives. And what our work has involved is trying to determine exactly what the child has said, um, how well it matches the life of somebody who died, and then also whether the child could have learned that information through normal means. Uh, so with, with our work, we've now studied over 2,500 cases. The children can come out with, with very specific details, sometimes names, uh, for somebody who lived quite some distance away, sometimes quite some time ago, and yet the details all fit. And then uh, along with the, the statements, the apparent memories, uh, the children will show a lot of emotions or behaviors that seem to fit also. Sometimes they'll recognize people or recognize buildings or, or places at, at the old place where the previous person lived. So uh, it, it all adds up to um, quite an interesting phenomenon where there does seem to be this connection between a, a past life and, and the current child. Well, we certainly try to use a scientific approach where we don't assume um, anything is the case that we don't have to. So every case we approach is an open question. What is the best explanation? And then it involves trying to nail down every detail that we can. We've got, um, I sort of specialize in, in the past life memory work. We have another researcher looking at near-death experiences. And, and then we have a laboratory where they do measurements like um, EEG, brainwave kind of measurements of, as people are trying to do um, uh, parapsychological tasks. Um, so all told, it, it's, there are maybe five or six of us working on this, along with the, the support research assistant and that sort of thing. We have a lot of cases. Um, one that I studied fairly recently was, there's a little boy in Oklahoma, who's, which is in the Southwest US, who started saying that he'd had a life in Hollywood. and. Uh, would get very upset about it, cry about missing his life. So his mom checked out a couple of books on old Hollywood from the library to see if they would stimulate more specific memories so that he could deal with them. Well, they were looking through them one day and there was a picture from an old movie and he stopped and pointed at one of the men and said, hey, that's George, I, I made a movie with him. And the man he was pointing to is George Raft, who was a movie star back in like the 30s. Uh, and then he pointed to another man and said, hey, and that's me, I found me. Well, the fellow that he pointed to, it turned out was an extra who had no lines in the movie. So it was impossible to identify who he was, uh, seemingly impossible. So the mom wrote to me to see if I could help identify him. And eventually through uh, a lot of work and, and the efforts of a Hollywood archivist, we were able to identify that man. Well, meanwhile, the mom is sending me emails all the time talking about the statements that, that this little boy is making about the past life. So uh, he talked about how he had danced on Broadway in New York and then gone to Hollywood. He was in the movies. Uh, then he worked for an agency. Uh, he said that he had seen the world on big boats and um, he had a, a house with a big swimming pool. And all of this seemed quite unlikely to me for an extra with no lines in a movie. But when we eventually identified the fella, he in fact had had that life. He, he had danced on Broadway, then he'd gone to, to Hollywood. He was in the movies for a while and then started a successful talent agency. Um, he and his wife went to Europe on, on the um, Queen Elizabeth. The little boy had said that the street address had the word um, rock, and this, the street address at this house was Roxbury. So this was one where the child gave a lot of specific details about someone who lived a long time ago. The fellow had died 50 years before the little boy was born. And it seemed impossible he could have learned about it through any normal means. Uh, so it, it looked like there was this connection with this fellow's past life.
I don't think that we can just map these cases onto a mainstream materialistic view of the world. I think uh, what they seem to indicate is that consciousness is not limited just to the physical brain, but can continue on after the brain dies. And I think there are reasons, other reasons to consider that consciousness should be considered separate from the physical world, that it's a separate entity and is not necessarily dependent on the physical world. In fact, the reverse may well be true, that the physical world is dependent on consciousness. Um, so in these cases, uh, this consciousness has continued after the brain died and, and for whatever reason has, has shown up again in, in somebody, uh, another person that w was born. Uh, that doesn't mean that that would typically happen, but it is what appears to have happened in our strongest cases anyway.